lecture 29 of ECE 5212, and this is this lecture and the next are kind of close to my heart because this is something that I've been studying ever since 2000, year 2000, and it's multi-carrier modulation. So you might see multi-carrier modulation in almost every device that you have now. Wi-Fi, it's all multi-carrier. DSL, cable modems, multi-carrier, multi-carrier. LTE, cellular communications, multi-carrier. Um, so you want to, we're going to look at in this lecture sort of the general concept of what multi-carrier modulation is all about. Okay? So what happens is when we transmit information, so we're going to look at the very physics of transferring information over the air, or over copper, or over fiber optic. We can manipulate how that information gets distributed across time and frequency. We can, we can also play other dimensions as well, but we're not going to. Not yet, anyway. But there are, we could also information across space. So the concept of frequency reuse. If we didn't have any frequency reuse in today's society, we would be in the stone ages of wireless technology. We would not be able to meet capacity that we do today. Uh, there's also code, like CDMA technology, right? Spread spectrum communications. There, there's even things like antenna diversity, right? If I polarize my antenna like this, I can send in. If I polarize my antenna like this, I can send it down another. There are very different ways I can slice and dice how I transmit information physically across a medium by playing around with its physical characteristics. So what we want to do is we want to look at something called multi-carrier modulation. So it comes down to this. So let's, let's draw it. And I know people are going to say, I can't see. So let me, let me show you. Mmm, coffee. So, I'm not sure how, I'm not, I'm not going to ask how many, well, maybe I should. So how many people here think in the time domain? How many people, okay, one. So that means everyone else here thinks in the frequency domain? Frequency domain people! Yay! Okay, okay. So, okay, and then how many people don't think in either domain? No, no, okay. So what happens is, and there is a, re there's a good reason. So let's say we, we accommodate both people. Time domain. So what happens if I transmit a signal that looks like this? So what happens is very rapid fluctuations, very small symbol period, right? This is my attempt at trying to draw a high-speed data symbol in real time. In the frequency domain, so let's say our symbol period is T. So we know that 1 over t is going to give us the bandwidth, right? And it's the, so the narrower the symbol period, the wider the bandwidth that we have. Now, if I have a very slowly changing transmission where the symbol period now is quite wide, what should my, in the frequency domain, so that's time domain, that's time domain, that's frequency domain, that's frequency domain, I should have, again, 1 over t, a very narrow transmission, right? So now, here's the crazy idea. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what happens is, now, suppose I have another slowly time-varying signal. Maybe I do that instead. Yes. Now, I have another narrowband transmission. Uh-oh, but I can't transmit the two at the same time. Not on the same frequency. But what happens, because remember we did this 10 lectures ago. We talked about the exact probability of error calculation when we have M orthogonal signals. How do we make them orthogonal? Different non-overlapping center frequencies. What happens if we have N narrow band? So very long symbol period, very low data rate, on different frequencies, all of them added together. They're orthogonal, so we can separate them out at the receiver. So the issue of them overlapping and not recovering is out the window. And instead, we have this guy here, FCK. Let's say he's the case 
of these narrowband slow data transmissions. And then we have his neighbor, FCK plus one, and his neighbor, FCK minus one, and we just concatenate them together. We call every narrowband low data rate transmission, we call them a subcarrier. And when we have multiple subcarriers, we have multi-carrier. What's really cool, what's really cool, look at this. It turns out, this is partly by coincidence, but partly not. I'm just glad the opportunity presented itself. What happens is, the bandwidth of a single carrier, which is the above guy, so one carrier, one frequency, single stream of high speed data, blah, 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 and then multiple subcarriers of low data rate transmissions stitched together such that the frequency bandwidth is equivalent to the guy on top. They carry the same amount of information, top and bottom. So you can send all your information really fast across a channel, or you can send your information really slow across multiple channels down individual narrowband transmissions in parallel going to give you the same amount of data per unit time. But wh so why do we bother with this guy? Why do we bother with multi-carrier modulation like this? The answer is equalization. Oh, so we, we do talk about equalization. The reason is, if let's say we have that high-speed data transmission, we use a time domain equalizer, Especially if it's zero forcing, it's going to be hundreds or thousands or millions of taps in order to recover from that ISI in the channel. How about the narrowband transmission? What does it see? Spectrally flat. It basically is a complex gain. It's attenuating that subcarrier. So all we need is this guy just needs to treat the ISI and the attenuation and whatever sort of bad stuff in his subcarrier, he does the same, he does the same, he does the same, he does the same, and so on. What do we call this? Oh, I love this because I use it in all my papers. It also sounds very warlike. Divide and conquer. So this multi-carrier modulation technique conquers the channel. Oh, that, I could just, I have this image just now. I'm in a suit of filter in my arm, and I'm like, channel. Yeah, yeah, I could just see photoshopping that right now. But what happens is what multi-carrier modulation does is, this is why it's so powerful a technique for high-speed data. That's why in today's society, like more and more applications have multi-carrier modulation. The, because the reason is, it takes a nasty dispersive channel and divides it up into beautiful flat fading individual little narrowband channels that can be treated by one, one, one equalizer tap. Ah, 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 ah. You know, that, that's an analogy to Sesame Street, if any of you know what that is, so. The beauty of multi-carrier modulation is because it divide and conquers the channel. Because, so, so it's more complex than a transmitter receiver implementation because you're going to have to now create all these N narrowband transmissions at different carrier frequencies, stitch them together, send them over a channel, and then the receiver, oh, now I have to separate every subcarrier out, treat it, demodulate it, and then reconstruct a high-speed transmission. But it's well worth it, because in Lecture 30, the solution for all that messiness is one simple little commonly used block that you might have heard of. <sighs> so this is a nicer way of drawing what I've just sort of screamed. What happens is, single carrier, you have a very high speed data transmission, it occupies a huge bandwidth, or you can split that up into n narrowband transmissions, each of which has a low data rate. So think of it from the perspective of the time domain. So to accommodate time domain people. What happens when your channel's dispersive and you have a high data rate? You have essentially very narrow symbol periods. 
can spread over multiple symptoms. Super bad. ISO-wise. On the other hand, when you stretch things out in the symbol period, your ISO of the channel is entirely captured in the one symbol. It doesn't spread. It is like nicely well contained. Beautiful. And in the frequency domain, Divide and conquer. So this is great. Multi carrier modulation is wonderful, but I'm biased, right? So ask somebody who works in single carrier and they'll say, ha ha, those idiots with multi carrier. So, this is, want to keep in note, again, you have no bandwidth advantage, one versus another, for the same data rates. They're both the same. by the delay spread way more than the multi-carrier. All right? So, and this is the third point, but I already screamed and wrote it on the board, divide and conquer. So this is something that you can talk about with your friends on Friday night. When you hang out and each other and it's like, yeah, divide and conquer, divide and conquer. And they'll say, what, is that World of Warcraft you're playing? No, that's like ECE 5312, you know? How many people here play World of Warcraft? One. Um, I'm trying to think, and who played Counter-Strike? Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and let me guess, you're the sniper that hides in the back and it's like, you know, someone pops out, headshot. Oh, okay, okay. How many people here, I just want to see, because maybe we'll have a LAN party Friday night. I won't tell my wife. How many people here play Halo of any form? Halo? Okay, Rashad, we're totally going to play Halo Friday night. I need it. Okay. And T how about Quake 3 Team Arena? Anyone play that still? Okay, thank you, Neil. I don't feel... <laughs> okay, how about Team Arena, right? Not, not the regular one, like the, like the full-scale, like, you know, geographical thing. You go through the valley, you take five minutes to get to the enemy base, and a boom! Quick live ah, okay, there is... How about StarCraft? Any StarCraft players? Okay, StarCraft... Oh, okay. <laughs> Z your favorite, Zergling, Protoss, or Terran? Terran? Protoss? Okay, no Zergling. Okay. Anyways, good to know. Okay. <laughs> um, so, going back to this, um, I digress. I should have put the uh, video recording on pause. Anyways, um, so what happens is, what we want is a multi-carrier modulation that the reason why we choose it, because it's robust to error, and I mentioned why. So we might have additional complexity in rearranging the data. So what's, what's another way of rearranging the data? So let's, let's take a look at that. Let me first clean this. I am going to... So let's say we look at the time frequency representation here, shall we? So let's say we take single carrier. Time, frequency. And so what happens is, over time, so high-speed data transmission, so each symbol, you know, takes a lot of frequency and is transmitted over a very short period of time, right? So graphically, every symbol looks like this, right? It's distributed like this across frequency and time. Now, so that is single carrier. Now, a uh, multi-carrier, the way it works is, let's say, let's say we have like over this period of time, like, you know, we have a certain amount of information. The way uh, multi-carrier works is it takes way longer. So let's say um, we can represent the spectrum in terms of n subcarriers. So as for the same bandwidth, so let's say that's big F, that's big F. And what happens is, let's say we divide it by n. So what happens is, we use one nth the bandwidth, but it takes n times as long. So what we essentially do, yeah. So let's say we have here n symbols. Here what we have, Almost the same. We have n symbols, 
But what happens is it, it, we have n subcarriers. Each subcarrier supports one symbol. And, it will t and whereas this takes, let's say, t seconds, this will take n t seconds long. So what do we see from this? We see that everything's conserved. Same amount of information per hertz per second, right? The only thing that changes is how we distribute the information. Do we slice it this way or that way? And there's another dimension that we don't bring up, which is code. So let's say we use spreading codes and stuff. That will be yet another dimension which we'll not talk about here. There's also a spatial dimension, polar. So we can graphically rep represent these dimensions. There's, some, there's a name, there's a fancy name for this, and it's called the electrospace. Oh my god, I'm giving you guys buzzwords today. Divide and conquer, the electrospace. If any of you become movie producers, create a film called Electrospace. I bet you it's going like, to you know, like appear on Netflix in no time. OK? OK. So, so what happens is this divide and conquer strategy, the way it, it lays out the information in frequency and time is great because it's used in DSL modems. How many people here use DSL? DSL? No, 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 no. How many people here use? Wireless local area networks, probably everyone. Um, and wireless metropolitan area networks, not, not so many, right? Like no one uses 802.16 anymore, right? I think LTE beat that pretty much. And yeah. Aw, too bad wireless man. <laughs> so how does a multi-carrier transceiver look like? It looks like a this. What multi-carrier modulation looks like is the following. You have your high speed going in here. The first thing you do is you demultiplex it. That's what the demux is for. So what's a great way of graphically representing that? Um, let me first clean that. It's a really cute way. You won't actually see this in an actual radio, but nevertheless, like un unless at your projects. Like, like what happens is do you see this when you open up a radio. Commutator. Actually, if you want to see a commutator, check out downstairs the power panel. They have one of those things, like you know, from like state of the art for 1910. No, I'm just kidding. They're not. What what happens is, what does this graphically mean? Assign a bit. Right, and the dwell. Dump, 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 dump. Information repeat. Right. So that's how you sort of distribute the information in that manner. Now, here, so that's one way of implementing a DMUX. You have all those symbol streams. What you could also do, X of n might not be symbols, I mean uh, bits, but they can also be modulated symbols already. These could be QAM symbols. And what happens is then you have these slower transmissions, like you know, these bands, you upsample it by n. And what does that do? It pads, puts n minus 1 zeros in between every symbol. Spectrally, what does this do? It compresses the spectra of each subcarrier by a factor of n. You have n replicas, and they're all one nth the width. Why do we do this? Because of the next step. The next step. And what's the next step? This thing, the g0n, g1 of n, all the way to gn minus 1 of n. We call those guys. Synthesis filter banks. So what happens is these G's, we call them synthesis filter banks. What these guys do is they take out a replica of your interpolated signal. Let's, it's best drawn. This is how we do it. So let's say this is my Let's say I have a bandwidth there, right? Here's zero. Should be symmetric. So let's say that's before interpolation. What happens after interpolation? Let's say we interpolate by, well, let's say by some factor, right? Right? So we have that. Then what my synthesis filter will do is they'll say, I am going to take this replica and take that and discard the rest. The other subcarrier 
will also interpolate by the same amount, but it will take another non-matching replica, such that at the end of the day, each synthesis filter takes out a replica that does not match the fre center frequency of any other replica and stitch it together. That's what we have here. We have each one a separate replica summed together, sent over the air. That's how we create the composite multi-carrier symbol. At the receiver, what's the first thing that we do? We analyze. We basically take the analysis filters and strip out this replica, forget about the rest, and then do the process of equalization. Well, first, yeah, so the equalizer is the, uh, no, sorry. So the analysis filters are the F of Ns. You have now the filtered replica. You downsample. What does downsampling do? <laughs> Spreads it out. Then we equalize the downsampled signal. And then what happens is you remultiplex it, and then you do your decision making at the receiver. Right? So what happens is this is where your divide and conquer comes in. You take your information. You split it up into these bands. You take the replicas, you stitch it together. No information's lost yet. And then at the receiver, replica expanded to what it used to be. Oh, I know that there's some channel distortion. Equalize for that using a single tap equalizer. Oh, yeah, stitch everything together. And then decision making, use it in quantizer or whatever it means. Cool, right? Yeah. OK. So given that, this is what happens. So the observations, so I think about this. So the data rate subcarrier n, but then when you combine it together, what happens? So it takes, like the symbol rate is n times, but you have n parallel narrowband streams altogether. So information loss, absolutely not. Everything's preserved. And then the upsampling, the reason why we do it is because of those precious replicas. This is how I tricked the system into, because, because the old, the, one of the first seminal papers on multi-carrier modulation was published in the 1950s, no, sorry, 1960s by Salzburg. And Salzburg, his technique was, okay, I start off already with this low data rate transmission. I modulate it using cosine modulation. I pulse shape it. Then I take its friend, modulate it to a different center frequency, pulse shape it. Combine, I'm like, oh my god, do that in hardware. What's going to happen? It's going to take forever, right? This technique is a little trickier. Where else do you see analysis and synthesis filter banks used? Image processing, speech processing, any sort of signal processing. Oh, yes, but with a twist. Whereas communication folks synthesize data, make the composite signal, send it over the channel, and then analyze, remove individual components from it. Image processing is What happens is, with image processing, what do you do? So you have your image, right? And so when you do, like, like you know, some sort of encoding, you take that information, right, and you, you take out the respective components and you transmit only the binary sequence over the channel. So it's reverse. You take the product, you analyze it, transmit it into the bitstream because we're digitizing the image. Send that digitized information over a channel and then synthesize the result back into the original image. It's the exact opposite of what communication systems do, right? We're taking digital information, creating the waveform. Image processing is taking the waveform, in this case the image, and creating the digitized bits and stuff out of it. Same thing with speech coding. It's all digitizing into ones and zeros. So it's the dual, if you will. We take transmitter. If you take the guy here, like um, what would be the best way? So forget about this guy here. And forget about this guy. Um, no, no, that guy you keep. Oh, yikes. How does this work? So basically what you do is the transmitter would become the receiver in the image processing process. And the receiver would become the transmitter. So opposite waveform, but it's to create the bits. So the goal is take the, so the x of n would be connected to this guy here. So this guy would go here, and the transmitter would actually be the receiver. 
And then this thing, this thing at this end, well, who cares? Because what happens is you then represent your image at this end, and you take your original image, and it gets decomposed that way. And you might say, or whatever, in order to break up that image. Okay. <sighs> So census filters, I mentioned about that. So, the, so here's one thing. Um, so you have the synthesis. And what you notice is that all of these guys are evenly spaced across frequency. And what they do is they form the composite signal. And the analysis filter removes, breaks up that composite signal into the individual components. And then what happens is the Ws are the equalizers. And the equalizers here. Um, if you choose your filters right, all you need to do, if they're narrow band enough, you just need to accommodate for any loss in the gain. If there's attenuation in that band, you just undo that attenuation. What's the problem? Noise. Because if there's noise in that signal, and you multiply by the inverse of the channel attenuation, what do you get? So you have an amplifying factor, you also amplify the noise. Do you have an SNR gain? Absolutely not. SNR is the same. So what would you want to do instead? Pre-equalize. What happens is you would put the Ws at the beginning end such that when the signal passes through the channel, it looks perfectly flat at the receiver. What's the problem with that? Feedback information. Who's saying that? You know? Yeah, exactly. What happens is you actually have to have feedback if there's a delay and the channel's time varying. That's also bad. So there, there, there's no perfect solution to any of this. OK. So what we're going to do now, oh, this is, you know what? This would be also a cool name for my house. But I don't think my wife would ever like it. Water filling. You know, here is water filling. It sounds cool. It's almost like Handel's water music. It's just like, and, you, and right now I have it in my, my, my head. Like, doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, no, just kidding. So what happens is, what's really nice about this structure for multi-carrier modulation is that this gives us an opportunity to look at analyzing Shannon's capacity, but from a multi-carrier perspective. Some of you might have taken my undergrad course and remember how I derived this. So this is the exact sort of same formulation that you might notice between the undergrad class and this class. So everyone remembers Shannon capacity? Yeah? Cool? One of several variants. So what happens is the channel bandwidth is W. Um, gamma is our signal-to-noise ratio, so it's the average by the PSD of the noise, and C is the capacity in bits per second of that channel. So with the multi-carrier channel, what can we do? Let's find the individual capacity per subcarrier. Totally legit. This is, the, this is a good way of doing it. Let's break down the Shannon capacity. What, so how do we do that? This is how we do it. So what we do is the capacity of the ith subcarrier, the bandwidth is equal to delta F, the transmit power is equal to PFI, so that's the transmit power at center frequency, FI. And remember, do we care, is it the received power or the transmit power that we would care about of the SNR it's received, right? So we take into consideration the attenuation of the channel, CFI, magnitude squared. Where do we get that? einstein wiener kinchin theorem, right? And then the delta F, because we're dealing with a density, right? So over this delta F, what is that power? And then the receiver is the noise power spectral density multiplied by the frequency range delta F. When we have all of this together, Let's combine this. Let's create something really cool. Overall capacity of a multi-carrier transmission. And that's it. It's the sum of all the individual capacities. So if you do it that way, and let's take it one step further. Let's assume delta F goes to zero. Let's say it becomes infinitesimally small. Some people would even say microscopic, right? How many of you watch Mr. Bean? Ah, oh, Rashad, you're just like raising your hand all the time. Good, good, good. Uh, uh, what, you know what's interesting about Mr. Bean, who's played by Rowan Atkinson? 
He's an electrical engineer by training. He's an electrical engineer. about him. He's an electrical engineer, which means there's hope for all of us to be comics, right? But what happened? Like, there's one place I think in his movie, which I think my wife refuses to watch, but I think it's a classic. And what happens is he's trying to give like some lecture or something like that, and he says, "Well, I would say this is almost microscopic," you know. So yeah, if if you want something fun to do Friday night, watch um, Mr. Bean. I forgot what the name of the movie, but it's really fun. It's really cool. That and also I'm trying to think if there's any other films. If any other suggestion comes up. Like, for instance, the season finale of How I Met Your Mother. No, just kidding. We let the limit of delta F go to zero. We now go from a discrete capacity approximation across subcarriers to one of an infinitesimal set of subcarriers. Essentially, what we're doing is we no longer have subcarriers, but we have a continuum. And so what we have here now is we go from summation to essentially across every infinitesimal unit of frequency of the transmission, we can compute what the overall capacity is across that channel. And we get this guy here. And sometimes what happens is we want to subject this guy to a total power constraint. Sometimes I would say we need to subject it to more than a total power constraint. Because theoretically speaking, what happens is you could transmit theoretically in one really high-powered signal in the middle and nothing anywhere else, right? That wouldn't be so good, right? Because imagine if, you're, if you transmit Everyone plays the too loud, right? So if you do that, You can actually, what I would do is I want to find out what is, what is the optimal in terms of, like, let's say if I have a C, you know, that's my channel, and here's my noise power spectral density, what should my power be? What should be, what should be my power across all that frequency? I optimize it using Lagrange multipliers. That's this guy over here. And what happens is you use something called calculus of variation. So I'm not going to actually work through it because everyone's going to go to sleep if I do that. Ah. What happens is if you do calculus of variations and obey the power total constraint, you get this guy. And if you do that, what you end up getting is your power across frequency is equal to something where it's like the inverse of the channel squared times the Noise, power, spectral density, all of that subtracted off some k. So what this graphic, it gives you this. So if you want to do, if you want to maximize your capacity, what you basically do is in your channel profile, wherever you have attenuation, you put more power into it. And wherever you don't have a lot of attenuation, you don't. We call it water filling. So if you have like your, your profile and stuff, what you would do is you would fill in the dips in that. And that's how you would optimally distribute in order to maximize capacity. Right? So that's, that's where the term water filling comes in. The classic approach, like unfortunately Proacus doesn't really talk about this too much. The classic, classic text on this is by Weinstein, uh, Jitlin, Hayes, and I forgot the fourth author. This is, this is a wonderful book. I think it's like published in 1980. But it pre presents how water filling is done from like this exact perspective. Okay? So the channel capacity is smallest when the channel SNR is a constant for, for all uh, F equal. Uh, and that's an element of the entire bandwidth. Okay? So that, folks, is sort of like sort of an overview of what multi-carrier modulation is. So what are, what are the key points? So we saw about capacity, but this is kind of, I would say what we just saw here was like a very nice aside, with the exception of one thing. If anybody here does adaptive modulation and coding, and what is adaptive modulation? So you might wonder what I did for my PhD. So my PhD dissertation was essentially I took multi-carrier modulation, 
And I said to myself, do I really need to have the same modulation scheme on every subcarrier? And the reason is, suppose the noise is constant, but the attenuation is different. And, and let's say I don't have equalization. Let's say I don't want to deal with feedback channels in that manner. What do I do? What happens is, let's say I need to obey an overall probability of error constraint. I would modify every subcarrier to have a modulation scheme such that the aggregate bit error rate does not exceed some sort of threshold. Now, the tricky thing is, do that and now modify the transmit power level at the same time. So now it becomes, um, so if you have n subcarriers, now you have an n-dimensional optimization problem with the modulation. Oh, but now if you throw power in, and power is a continuum of power values, or theoretically it's a continuum, but in reality, you can discretize it, especially if you have like a lookup memory or something like that. So it becomes really complex. And then if you throw equalization into the mix, now what happens is suppose that you have your, e your subcarrier is not narrow enough. There is some fluctuation, you need more than one tap. How do you load different length equalizers in every subcarrier of your multi carrier system? So things get very complicated. That's why divide and conquer is a whole new meaning when you take adaptive modulation coding. You can modify every subcarrier. You can tailor it to exactly the environment that it's operating across. And therefore, you have like, you know, maximum control. But the problem is, and this is what my PhD advisor told me at the end of my PhD. It was a, it was a, I know what he meant, but it didn't sound great at the time. I'm like, oh, he says, where can your thing ever be implemented? That's not the best thing to hear from your PhD advisor. Where can your thing be implemented after you graduate? The reason is he wasn't really sure about what software-defined radio was at the time. He heard about it, but he was, he was more invested in speech communications anyway. And where was my first job at? University of Kansas. What did I do at University of Kansas? OFDM and software-defined radio. And so I found a home for all of this. So yeah. So what happens is this concept of capacity sort of illustrates that divide and conquer approach and how you can use it to manipulate information to max. You can tailor the environment. The other thing to remember, and we didn't go into any detail about, is multi-carrier modulation can be really difficult to implement in a generic manner. There is a thesis. There's a thesis that I looked at when I was at doing my PhD, and it was a previous PhD student lab who submitted it in 1990 by name of Ravi Ramachandran. And he looked at all these different filter designs for the analysis and synthesis filters, how you make them perfect reconstruction, near perfect reconstruction, how do you design them, how do you make the inverses of them. It was phenomenal, right? So what we just were exposed to is the power of multi carrier modulation as well as how to sort of visualize that divide and conquer from a temporal frequency perspective. Yes, Mustafa. So between single carrier and multi carrier modulation, yeah. the channel capacity doesn't change. It's the power efficiency. Exactly. So, 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 the, so in terms of the single carrier and multi carrier, so the question is um, the capacity stays, the capacity under, let's say, Stable, flat conditions stay the same. But let's say you have a frequency selective fading channel, um, and the noise power spectral density is approximately the flat. What your so there is there is a caveat. So I'll bring that up. There's always a caveat. But multi carrier versus single carrier with nothing fancy, multi carrier modulation. What it can do is it can tailor the power levels just by itself. Forget about adapting the modulation scheme. Um, such that you can maximize uh, the, uh, the, the capacity of your transmission, as opposed to, well, maximize in the sense of what? So first of all, probability of error. If you can change the modulation scheme, that's even better. Single carrier don't have any sort of flexibility over frequency domain. Now, there's a guy at university, no, Carleton University by the name of David Falconer. And what he tried doing a lot is push this idea, and it's also used in LTEA, um, the idea of frequency domain, uh, sorry, uh, single carrier frequency domain multiple access. And it, what it does is it does the division between frequency and time domain before the signal even gets sent out. All the processing is done entirely at the receiver or entirely at the transmitter, all this divide and conquer business. So you have the single carrier transmission, it's corrupted, it's all that. 
What Falconer's approach does is it takes it, splits it up into its individual components, treats each individually, and stitches it back together. So that way you don't have an equalizer thousands of taps long. You have a nice, compact frequency domain equalizer in your implementation. But it's still single carrier by definition. So, yeah, so there are a lot of solutions out there. And what in the next lecture, lecture 30, what we're going to be looking at is, is probably the most popular one of them all. Okay? All right. So with that, um, that concludes uh, lecture 29. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a five-minute break. What we're going to do is we're going to wrap up.